Good afternoon. Another Monday here at the Institución Libre de Enseñanza to continue on this seminary on democracy and communication. And in this case, we can now frame the context with an example of communication and democracy that we have seen in our country, in our own country. And we are going to touch upon a central point during these weeks, we have been seeing a series of distortions that took place in the public space in a very specific way. We have touched upon some aspects that are cultural aspects as well. We have been now digging deeper into that complex side of new technologies and how they influence in the way in which we communicate the political um, aspects and how the political side of things is um, is impacted, how we disinform instead of inform through these new strategies. And today, we are going to be doing a politological um, and serious analysis, an intelligent analysis, because the person that we have here today with us, Marianne Knoyer, who uh, I'm going to briefly introduce, is um, actually a representative of this sort of, of focus, of approach. So Marianne and I have um, known each other for a very long time. We were together in the International Association for Political Science. She was, I believe, um, it was before she became the president of the International Association of Politologists, which is IPSA, where she was... Um, President for two years, I believe, and then two years after president and th two years before becoming a president. Is that correct? Yes, but due to the pandemic, it was actually three years. Yes. So, so two plus two. Well, yes, I wanted to start with that because it actually means that this is a person who has international recognition. It is obvious she's a very, um, she's, uh, she's, a person who's always interested by things. She has traveled a lot. She will be speaking in perfect Spanish. She's a cosmopolitan politologist, but she's also a broker, we could say, in the best sense of the world of the word. Um, she brokers for um, study centers, investigation centers. She was in Hildesheim. She is now doing it in from Dresden. She will now be at the Kellogg's Institute um, doing a course in the U.S. So. She is a restless person, we could say, who's always vigilant to everything that is happening. And obviously, her, her topic is democracy, democracy in all of its shapes and forms. She has worked on um, case studies. And I actually remember a magnificent text that you presented in the Spanish Association of Political Sciences in Salamanca that was then published in Sistema. And so you can read it. If, if you want to, you could read it. And she's a person who is who's always conscious of changes, transformations that are taking place in democratic systems. She formally has been integrated in her speciality in political science, which we call compared politics, although I think it has a component as any uh, good um, academic, um, German academician, she always has a theoretic philosophical component, which is quite solid. And I wanted to highlight it because the topic that we are going to be touching upon today cannot be understood if it is not seen through that approach. So. Since she has published so many articles, I would rather not just read them all. You can find it online. And Marianne, thank you so much for coming. You are a very busy person. So thank you for finding the time to be here with us. It is really a privilege for all of us. Thank you. The floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, Fernando, first of all. I, I believe you have your microphone. Yes, I do have a microphone and I hope that you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes? Okay, good. So, first of all, thank you. Thank you so much for your words. Too kind, I have to say, really too kind. But since we're friends, we're old friends, I just want to thank you. And I would also like to thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm honored by this, by, by this institution's invitation, a very impressive institution. So I would like to thank the director, Elisana, 
Navas, Elisa Navas, and I would also like to thank you, Fernando, because you were the person who who connected me with them all. So thank you. And obviously, it is a great pleasure to be here in Madrid. It's always a pleasure to be back in Madrid. I always say go back because actually, I do believe that this city, this beautiful city, is my second home. So. That is why I always say back and I don't say visit. I'm back in Madrid, not visiting Madrid. And I also wanted to thank you for coming. Thank you all for coming to this keynote presentation. And thank you for being here to talk about this topic with me. And I would like to thank all the participants who are online because I was told that there were quite a few. So it is a day, as Fernando Vallespin has very well said, that is quite interesting, isn't it? It's a very important uh, day and very much connected to what I'm going to be talking about today, which is the public sphere. And maybe we could also talk about it later on, because obviously I had not uh, prepared um, this this situation. I mean, I, I, I did not think that they would be presenting an example for me here in Spain, but I do think that obviously we can talk about it later on if you want. So in principle, Fernando, knowing more or less what it is that I am working on, um, I was asked to talk about deliberative democracy and the deviation of the ideal. Well, the topic, as it has been formulated, um, makes us wonder about two things. What is the ideal and what is deviation? And I would like here to talk about those two aspects. Although I can already reveal that I'm going to be advancing um, this argument, which is the fact that we need new approaches to really um, adequately understand the public sphere and its deliberative dimension. And I would also like to present a concept which I have developed together my, with my colleague Lance Bennett. So when we talk, um, actually, I have to, to move this presentation, obviously, Yes, I'm sorry about that. So uh, I'm multitasking, as they say. So when we talk about um, the ideal for deliberation, unavoidably, we find ourselves with Habermas. Habermas, who is the uh, creator of the influential theory of deliberation and the democratic deliberation. So. There is an intense debate with Habermas theory since he published his referential work in 1962. Sorry. And I promise you, I am not going to reproduce it. That's good. That, yeah, I think it's good. But I'm going to criticize it, that's for sure. So, and allow me, please to do the following because I'm going to make an interesting observation because two years ago in the 60th anniversary of that work transformation of the structure of public of public structure of public sphere so two years ago there was a sort of 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 event to take stock where Habermas was also present. And the consensus was that the reality had already become far from the ideal that Habermas had described. And many apologists were actually talking about individual elements and proposing adjustments to the theory. Funnily enough, although those authors could have agreed with the fact that it was necessary to correct the ideal described by Habermas, at the same time they were producing uh, few, um, few ideas of a new path to follow. So not only do I want to show the argument uh, from a theoretical and from an empirical point of view um, states that we cannot understand reality with Habermas concept, but um, differently to other works, I would go a, a step forward and I will um, expose to you an enlarged and realistic concept in the sense that we can um, use it empirically to analyze the deliberative field. So what is the ideal? And let's summarize a bit what, what the concept is, what a Habermas theory is. I am sure that you all already know this theory, but just a um, um, summary to be sure. First of all, uh, openness, obviously, um, 
equality of all of us, of all the citizens, with regards to communication, that is very, very important. Then the norms and the rules for the participation, especially um, inclusion, being civil and so on. And then the nucleus of it all, of the theory of Habermas, which is the strength of the reasoning. So obviously he always thinks that uh, deliberation will be based on reason. And those deliberations lead later on to results that will be rationally uh, um, exact or certain. That is the nucleus or the core of the theory. Then it's also very important for Habermas, the civil society which has to have a certain freedom uh, with regards to the entrepreneurial and state uh, um, forces and should also be capable of producing information. And obviously all of that will allow us to fight for democratic objectives to solve differences and political conflicts. So there are always conflicts, um, have political conflicts in Habermas as well, but they are solved via uh, that reasoning and that those uh, re rational deliberations with a public opinion that is independent and the citizens' action is always informed. So that is the ideal, to summarize it um, in a few words. So as, as I mentioned already, the, most, uh, the newest works uh, suggest that current current democracies, and it's not difficult to show and to see, are further from the um, Habermas ideals than that he formulated in the 60s than we were in the 60s. So we're further now than we used to be. And we shouldn't man mention the reasons because obviously um, there are more inequities in neoliberal societies due to the globalization, there is a fragmentation, a social fragmentation as well. And, and obviously, that is an important reason of, in this presentation, will the increase of the media, of the digital media that are altering in a significant way our debate, our public, our public debate. Okay, so... Now that we're talking about that digital sphere, we could also talk about a disruption, an additional disruption, which has been mixed to this whole series of, of things that Habermas was describing. So he calls this the third transformation because what he described in the 60s was the second transformation, according to him. And now he was talking about the third transformation of the uh, public sphere. Well, we once again uh, listen to Habermas and what he says about this third transformation. Well, first he says that there is an expansion, a centrifugal expansion of communication towards... Um, that is accelerated, an expansion that is uh, pushing all the users to become independent authors. We know that. We see that in platforms. But, and this is something that he thinks is very important, uh, platforms themselves are not responsible for the content and the intermediaries or the interfaces, these intermediaries, do not have any responsibility with regards to the content that they publish that they publish in those platforms so we have non-regulated content and above all we are lacking professional filters and editorial filters to to correct and to review to um, to increase the quality so there are two effects seen by Habermas himself. On the one hand, he talks about the democratizing effect because obviously the, um, these, this allows for all citizens to participate. That is democratizing to him. But on the other hand, there is no substitute for the professional selection and to check 
there is no verification of the contents and that clearly is a problem. Okay, so up till here, I think we all agree because it's quite an accurate description and it's, it is actually agreed upon this description of digital communication, but there is an open question. With what sort of public sphere are we dealing then today? And with what sort of public sphere are we going to be dealing in the future? And to, to give an answer to that question, I think that Habermas is uh, quite mute. He does not give really an answer. And it surprises me. It surprises me. Well, he's old. Well, he's old. Well, yes, he's old. But uh, nonetheless, he did receive the Nobel Prize. Uh, for political sciences two weeks ago, the Yonenskit um, um, Award. So, I mean, in any case, it's surprising to see that Habermas does not give us an explanation with regards to the consequences uh, this may have. And that is also the, the starting point for me, because... I do think that we have to abandon the idea, the Habermas idea, that there are only liberal democracies. Because he always, obviously, a public sphere, liberal public sphere that he talks about, exists in a liberal democracy, obviously. But we have to, to understand, that's my argument, that we have, to, we have to understand that there are only liberal democracies with liberal, de, liberal communication where there is Habermas deliberation. So in other words, not only Habermas and his followers, but also his critics usually consider that democracies uh, provide those liberal spaces for deliberation. But on the other hand, I believe that that does not correspond with the reality because we have strong dynamics within the democracies themselves that are still democracies but with demo with dynamics and we have to take into account or we have to think about concepts that take into account those dynamics as well so the starting point would be the following if there is a public sphere that is a liberal public sphere according to Habermas the Habermas public sphere, then maybe that will not be the only variant, the only way. We suggest that in the first place, there is an anti-liberal uh, public sphere that should also be considered together with a liberal public sphere. And secondly, the second argument is that we think that this anti-liberal type is quite prosperous in the uh, current um, conditions of digital communication in the 21st century. And those public um, illiberal spheres, illiberal public spheres as we call them, modify the conditions of deliberation. So the concept that we have developed is opposed to, to that I, illiberal sphere as a concept to that ideal world that Habermas created, that Habermas created. Okay, so why, why does that seem more useful to us? Why is it more useful to talk about illiberal public spheres and to say farewell to that, to that normativity that um, Habermas has and had in his ideal? First of all, because as I said already, what we observe, we don't have that uh, pure democratic public sphere. And because Habermas is too descriptive, and he, but he does not speak when we talk about the, the analysis and the consequences, etc. And also what's the problem with Habermas is that his concepts are quite static. They cannot uh, capture those dynamics that I was talking about. So 
I do think that we have to review that in depth. And I'm really sorry, but now, since this is part of a publication that we have, um, that we have drafted Lance Bennett, my colleague and I, and that is already published in English, I have uh, shown the table here in English. I hope you don't mind. And there, And we have to understand that this column here is the uh, ideal Habermas world of the uh, liberal sphere, democratic liberal sphere. And these are the principles that we have opposed to it with regards to the public illiberal sphere. So starting with the openness to participation, what Habermas thinks is the ideal, obviously, for all groups to participate, we talk about an exclusion, about an intentional exclusion of the others by, by groups that, are, that want to exclude minorities mainly, or religious minorities or sexual minorities, racial minorities, etc. And that exclusion entails a, a non-recognition and a lack of civility. So those are the participation rules or the exclusion um, rules. And the role of the media in the public illiberal sphere are based on, on concentrating the information in extremist groups that um, are circulating the information on digital platforms. And also, it is based in illiberal leaders who attack and undermine the trust in the mainstream press. And then these attacks also, selective attacks against the credibility of the of the authority and credibility of the press and public institutions is very important as well so what are the the information so where do these informations come from well they come from marginal french movements they come from from influences political influences, and also from elected illiberal politicians and their alternative authorities. So these are groups that can already get into the government or could be um, part of the government, but that also push towards those alternative informations. Well, that is, results in a logic for the public debate, which entails um, statements of absolute truths and um, things that cannot be uh, cannot be disputed. We all know those conspirational narratives that are being put forward by groups in that sense. And those groups can be either from outside of the government, but also from within the government. I mean, both things are, are possible. Both scenarios are possible. Now, the objectives, the normative goals, we've already heard that in the case of Habermas is about resolving conflicts in democracy and to make progress and to advance uh, in order to find a consensus, a rational consensus. Well, in the illiberal public sphere, it's quite the opposite. It is about, well, the objective, the goal is to amplify conflicts to mobilize the public, the audience, and to mobilize voters as well. So up to here, my new concept, this new concept that we think is much more realistic than that of the Habermas world, because, because it includes those groups that are active and that are changing the dynamic in the public sphere. So, 
let's take a look now at this puzzle this empirical puzzle so what happens with quality with the quality of uh, deliberation and we are now going to to see the empirical uh, phenomenon. let's take a look at um through time so here i'm showing you data of a democracy index there aren't many indexes that will measure deliberation so that is why i use the writers of democracy because they provide us with that 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 deliberation measure so first of all let's look at the graph to the to the left that shows the season from 2001 till 2011, that period, that time period. And what we see here is that the axis, the, the X a horizontal axis, shows all the countries that have seen a worsening of, the, of all the democratic elements. And as you can see, there are no cases here. And in the Y axis, we can see the um, democratic elements and and whether there's been an improvement and what we see here is that we are doing quite well with regards to uh, freedom of expression and the quality of uh, deliberation so i have a, a pointer here so you should be able to see here this freedom of expression and deliberation quality and it's doing fairly well so this situation completely changes in the next decade from 2011 till 2021 because as you can see well all of the elements have in have worsened but what has really worsened radically worsened is the uh, freedom of speech and the quality for deliberation so all through time and looking at both decades we can see that even if if all the elements of democracies were to be considered, they all have uh, declined, they all have been deteriorated, but these two, more so than the rest, more so than the rest, and more significantly than the rest. So now asking what it is that has worsened? Well, we could look at two important elements here within the deliberation we have the reason justification and then respecting the opponent's arguments now here as well in this curve with regards to reason justification we see that everything is doing well until 2011 2012 and from then onwards there is a decrease in the quality for this element and same can be seen with regards to respecting the opponent's arguments until 2011, 2012, more or less. It goes, um, well, we cannot say that it's doing well, but better than afterwards. And then there is a decline. And here, if you see here, it's quite interesting, but there is another drop here in the quality of the respect to the opponent's arguments. And that is in 2020, which is the year of the pandemic, when there were lots of conspirational narratives and lots of conflicts between the people who who were uh, denying the reality and the facts regarding health and so on regarding the pandemic and so on so we see here that there are some decisive points here this is a tipping point for the decline in the uh, willingness to accept other people's opinions. So, to, to complete this, this whole um, uh, image, we have to take a look at the role of the media and the social media as well. Social media have um, an important role. I don't need to explain it here today because they voice uh, the extremists who have been marginalized in democracies and they offer them a platform so that they can disseminate, yes, social networks. That's how we call them, yes. 
Yeah, social media is in Spanish redes sociales. Um, he's just correcting her Spanish just so that no, no, everyone understands. Don't worry. Well, thank you very much, uh, social um, social media. So we also have the great corporations, media corporations, such as that of Murdoch, which have a world reach and that amplify the political attacks against governmental regulation, for instance, and a public, public interest politics. So those big corporations also have an influence, a quite, quite an important influence. But then we also have illiberal actors and their political parties that, uh, prov that provide support to disinformation sites to mobilize the public so that they will vote, so that they will protest. And, and that obviously, I mean, there are very good examples such as Donald Trump and his, his social network um, or Fox. I mean, Donald Trump will use the conventional media, obviously. He uses the TV, but he also uses social, social networks, Truth Social, for instance. And then what's also relevant is to see that the social network companies do not want to forbid that disinformation because it is quite profitable. For instance, X, previously Twitter, that belongs to Elon Musk or TikTok as well. So we can make lots of money with this by disseminating disinformation. So obviously there isn't much incentive to forbid it. So a whole industry uh, is being created to, dis to disseminate disinformation. But this, um, aside from this, it is also important, and this is very important for me, because we always talk about platforms, about structures, etc. But we also have to take into account that behind those structures, behind those platforms, etc., there's always human beings. There are actors. And, and thus, I do want to call us all... Um, to attention with regards to the actors, which is an element that is not usually very present in the in the concept of Habermas, because Habermas also talks about journalists, he talks about platforms, but he doesn't talk about the actors that promote the erosion of the of this 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 change, this deriv this and the actors that promote the erosion of the liberal public sphere. And those actors, those strategic actors, we call them, I call them strategic actors because the actions that, that, they, that they, they start, that they promote, that, that they feed, are strategic. I mean, they do not do it randomly they do not do it without a clear strategy and that strategy is to exploit the characteristics the structural characteristics of the network and these actors these strategic actors know very well the um the potential and the properties of the network of the and they also um, exploit the epistemic uncertainty. I don't know if you remember the pandemic. It was a situation of great uncertainty, epistemic uncertainty. I mean, for all of us, for for all citizens, and and for all citizens in general. So, so they can feed that propaganda, that disinformation with with false information, fake news, and so on. And obviously, they can attack real um real facts and they produce that's also a strategy they produce confusion that is also part of of their strategy producing confusion well in the end those actors the strategic actors also use that toolkit all of those methods to mobilize their their voters, their actions, their movements. And in the US with Trump, we can see it very well where that leads us. But we also have to understand that 
Within that whole strategy, there's also um, a, a, a very a very profound um, contempt against democratic structures. And to conclude, I would like to highlight that there is a strong interaction between that illiberal communication that I have tried to describe here and the democratic erosion that is, that is happening in many countries, in many societies. And those two phenomena cannot be separated. That is also a problem with Habermas because he always has his communication system and then he has the political system, but it's not really like that. Both systems are interconnected. Both systems are intertwined. So the conclusion, the most important conclusion, in my opinion, is not really that there is a deviation of the ideal. I mean, obviously, yes, we do observe it, all of us, don't we? But the problem is that that deviation is intertwined, is completely ingrained in democratic institutions, and it has to do with their credibility, the credibility of those institutions, and finally, with the legitimacy of institutions themselves. Because all of the things that happen in the public sphere have obviously an impact in the credibility and the legitimacy of the institutions, of those democratic institutions. So there is a link between the communication systems of the public sphere and the democratic institutions and the um, and the characteristics of communication in the public sphere are not isolated from institutional quality because otherwise the communication will not determine the citizen commitment, the political parties, the elections and the policies in the end. And the danger, and my greatest worry, is, and that is why obviously I have different projects right now um, ongoing in my department, it, the great danger is that that re reduction or, or of the trust towards public institutions and trust to authoritative information will will make a big public keep on looking for alternative facts. So the danger lies in the fact that all of the erosions, all of the erosions of the public sphere will lead us to a democratic erosion, just to, to say it in a few words. So what are the dangers or what are the, what, who are subject to this danger? Well, we can identify them quite easily because it's the anti-liberal and liberal leaders that I was talking about. They're the ones who, who are pushing forward this process of democratic erosion. They mobilize with their strategies, with their disinformation strategies, and they justify corruption and, and different um, actions in the executive. But the democratic erosion, on the other hand, is an open process. I mean, we cannot control it. We cannot control that process. That depends on the power of the agents, the agents of the said erosion. And that can be uh, observed with uh, Jair Bolsonaro, Viktor Orban, Erdogan, uh, Trump, and many others who know how to mobilize their followers and how to, to twist the laws and democratic processes. And when those leaders, I, illiberal leaders, control the government, so the moment that they are in government, they can, they can increase the powers of the, uh, of the executive and weaken um, the, 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 the parliament as well as the tribunals. And then there is the other implication, obviously, they can use once again this disinformation and their propaganda to justify those changes. And what happens is, and this can also be observed in the case of Viktor Orban, that later on that leader, that illiberal leader, will impose the logic of a public sphere, a liberal public sphere, 
trumping the uh, logic of the liberal public sphere. So little by little, gradually, step by step, they will replace the liberal public sphere that had existed once in Hungary, for instance, and they switch it with an illiberal public sphere. And the more they impose that logic, the more they uproot the democracy and the more authoritarian the public sphere becomes. So, in principle, that is what I that I was, wanted to share with you uh, since I am almost at the end of my keynote, but I would not want to leave you hopeless, completely hopeless. No, we're used to it. Don't worry about that, Marianne. Well, I would like to end with my last slide and with some suggestions about how we can fight against that situation. Because I think that that, um, as, as, I, as Fernando had mentioned already to me, it is very important. I am a theorist, but I am also interested in, in seeing the challenges ahead and to try and change things and, in this case, to try and fight against that dynamic. So first of all, we have to develop new uh, approaches to regulate this, this, this uh, communication that I have described that is quite, that, that is, that is quite, um, I would say, disruptive. So we would have, first of all, to fight against the platforms that try to disinform. So how can we start uh, w setting new norms and standards? Well, we have to demand from social networks to adopt those um, rules. Those, and this is very important. They have to open their algorithms to inspections. Because without that, obviously, we will not make any progress. If there isn't the possibility of, of, of looking into the algorithms, we will not be able to make much progress. Now, the second point would be um, a very important point. We will see that we have seen it this year because there are many elections in very decisive countries. Well, we have to protect the integrity of elections. Election, electoral processes are sometimes the objective of disinformation or the objective, the target for manipulation, strong manipulation. We see that in Europe, in the countries that are close to Russia. We can see that we can see how Russia will have an influence in these ele these elections and in these campaigns, and in the communication around them. So we have to make social networks more transparent during the campaigns for regulators, for journalists, and for investigators. So we have to protect the elections in the field of communication that is very important and also and uh, i insist in mentioning this because i do believe that we have to develop public policies and educational programs to promote information of quality and public communication that can resist that disinformation, the propaganda, and illiberal actors fighting against it with their conspirational narratives. So that component, that education component, I know it's easier said than done, but I think that we cannot talk about deliberation and public sphere and disinformation and propaganda without also talking about education and above all in this institution, the institution of Libre Enseñanza, of free, uh, of free teaching, we have to talk about this. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, lots of topics have been tackled, all of them very interesting, and we are now going to be getting some questions from the audience here. And if there aren't any questions here, then we will contact those online while the public thinks about their question. Javier, do we have any questions in the amongst the audience? Yes, um, I do have a question, a question that we could ask. 
Well, thank you. Thank you for this conference. Thank you so much for the presentation. There were lots of different ideas, and I'm actually thinking about different different things. But one of the things that really um, I thought was interesting was the chronological data, the um, graphic that shows varieties of democracy that shows a decline in, in freedom of speech and deliberation since 2011-2012. I think this is quite interesting because those years were the years when um, social media started taking off. That's when the social media started taking off. But it's also the years when the global cycle of uh, campaigns against austerity started, which somehow shows that the legitimacy of the economic model and political uh, model uh, was breaking down during globalization, which we summarize as neoliberal. So it is a moment as well where there is a rebirth of the ideological dispute. Somehow it could lead us to thinking that maybe before those years, we didn't have much to deliberate on because there was a sort of hegemony at the time. So my question is, isn't it to some extent legitimate that uh, during crisis and rupture moments there is also a sort of problem in deliberation that are linked to uh, legitimacies that are in conflict? And the question that I have, I mean, the, the most direct question would be, how can we make the difference between the legitimate components of that, of, of that situation and the more uh, pathological components of that confrontation. That's a very interesting question. Can you hear me? Yes, because my acoustic is very weird here. Well, actually, as a matter of fact, There are two things that I think are interesting in, in your question. The first one has to do with the moments of crisis and rupture. What happens, and I think, I think that is very close to us, the pandemic as a crisis, a trans mega crisis, a transnational mega crisis. And now, well, after the pandemic, another crisis and another crisis, so we're in, in a in a a constant crisis situation and and what does that mean well it means that apparently during the crisis what we could observe was that the trust of the population at least that's the data that we have from germany but i think it is something that could also reflect the situation in all the societies really um, in europe during the pandemic, the trust in democratic institutions went up quite a bit in an extraordinary way, I'd, I'd even say. So in Germany, 20 points, 20 points, um, we saw an increase of trust in institutions of 20 points. And that was surprising. And they said, oh, yes, that's the crisis. And during the crisis, well, if people feel well governed, then they're fine, and and the trust will go up in institutions. But it was a new phenomenon, really. And what we can observe now is in 2022, 2023, we see that trust has gone down again. And that happened in Germany, but also in other societies, it has gone down. Trust has gone down in institutions, in democratic institutions. Well. That is difficult to explain, isn't it? I mean, we can observe it, but um, to the other side of things, since we are in a permanent crisis, we could also think that, for instance, that trust would um, stay higher, but it didn't. It was not the case. So that is something that I can think about, about crisis and rupture as well. Now. What happens with regards to that crisis? Well, and I think that uh, you also talked about anti-capitalist anti movements, anti-neoliberal movements in the years 2010 and so. 
we have to think now in the 20 um, or even before that maybe that with a new development which is which has to do with civil society because we always thought about civil society as as a liberal movement emancipating movement with with advanced values for something good right so the emancipation of women whatever it is all the movements that can be called civil society they have they have those characteristics but now we have parts of society that are apparently a civil society as well that i call the dark civil society which are those strengths that are not emancipating forces that are not based on liberal values or democratic values and that do not want to advance something positive as the emancipation and so on they are rather groups that want to undermine the structures that exist the the structures that be and what they want is to destroy they want to destroy but they are also part of civil society. So what do I mean by that? I mean that we have a very diverse civil society and, and it is dark and not dark. And what happens? Well, this diverse civil society is in the social network, uh, social media as well. So. So all of that diversity of civil society, whether it's dark, whether it's, it's not dark, can communicate online. And that creates diversity in social networks, but it also creates more polarization, more confrontation, and more lack of civility. So I don't know if, if that answers your question and your worries. Yes, but in any ways, it is something that we all have to think about because, because we don't have an answer. We don't really have an answer to that challenge. There is a question here. Just a second, the microphone is it's getting to you. Hello. My question uh, to the two of you, maybe, is to what extent has the way in which communication has changed between politicians and, and citizens change had an impact because in the in the social in social media we find all politicians and they can sometimes have conversations uh, with citizens where they reply to one another as if they were in the school uh, playground they talk to citizens directly that has changed the way in which politicians communicate themselves it's a more direct way and sometimes it can be less reflexive because in the social media you can write something just um, send it quite quickly and you don't have that capacity to deliberate or to talk to other people about it before you send it send that message so maybe with regards to what happened with the, uh, uh, the president of the government, he talked directly to the citizens through a social, uh, to a social platform. So I wanted to ask you this question. Uh, doesn't that have an influence in communication in the way in, and in what we're talking about, about this, 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 um, these problems in democracy and so on? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I think that you're absolutely right. And... We talk about this direct communication with, with citizens and that is quite significant because uh, politicians do not need a conventional media now. They don't need to get their attention because they can create that attention on their own through their, their own social media with their own communication and they can talk directly to the citizens and talking about the president, 
of the government, Pedro Sánchez, I I thought, I mean, I I come to Spain to to visit and to uh, to the do, to do this presentation and you give me this example um, magnificent example of strategic communication because it's actually what you were saying um, Pedro Sánchez has used a, a tool an inst an instrument that is all, we could say that it's um, Um, like a plebiscitary um, tool. No, he hasn't talked to the parliament and he hasn't talked to the party either. So he hasn't talked to the parliament or to the party apparently. So he has just talked to the to the to the people, and that is what we call in in political sciences plebiscitary. So you are you are taking all the channels, all the conventional channels, um, because the parliament is 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 the the representation of the people isn't it so so that's how they say it right it's a it's a method that uh politicians can also exploit okay, may i add something to to the to this point i i do not participate in the questions i mean but that gives me the possibility of of asking something regarding to what you have just asked. I mean, what is really the real rupture, the real uh, break of the Habermas ideal? That would be my question, because I, 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 I think that it can be summarized in just one word, which is dis disintermediation. There are less and less intermediaries, and the example that we have just given is, is quite obvious. And... Obviously, from the moment when when we break with mediations that we had institutionalized, then their chaos appears, and that chaos is something that other voices benefit from, voices that should not have been heard. And I think that one of the great successes of of populisms and extremisms is that they have managed to include in public conversation voices that intermediaries would rather not listen to and avoid it. And I think that uh, some voices are quite legitimate, for instance, a greater aspiration to justice. But as you were saying, then there is that dark part uh, that also that exists in all of us, obviously, and it exists in society, and then it, it just overflows, so suddenly it overflows. And this is something that we don't know how to function with, because on the one hand, the authoritas of the system depends on a series of institutional protocols, but on the other hand, the fact that that does no longer work is what is breaking with that legitimacy or eroding that legitimacy, would I say, rather. And we have to twist it a bit further, because... An expert came here, I don't know if you know about this, but it's really very interesting. An expert in AI is analyzing how a company that use, that different political forces use in, in the US, um, um, intelligence, artificial intelligence in the uh, Indian electoral campaign, they are starting to, to set up a new sort of communication that doesn't even use the intermediation of, of media, of platforms that we were talking about. What it does is, through the cell phone, it uses a communication system, a direct uh, communication system to each individual. So it's as though you're in, you're in an electoral campaign in Germany and then suddenly your cell phone beeps and you, you grab your phone and an avatar uh, looking like Olaf Scholz says, uh, Dear Marianne, I don't know if you know this part of my program that has been thought of for people like you. And, and, and then there will be someone else, some other candidate, a Habeck or whomever, and they will say, No, actually, I'm justifying my government to you, not to others, but to you. So what's the problem? The problem is that we cannot observe what is happening because the communication is no longer public. So the, 
communication platforms can see what happens in can see what happens in the network but they cannot see what happens in our pockets if i just take my cell phone what they're telling us for us individually for us and i think that that is going to be the next revolution because it's going to be completely opaque yes yes what you're describing is is a step forward but in the last in the last elections in the us there were what we call micro targeting and that also is is similar because micro targeting means that the communication be between the people who um, feed the electoral campaign with information communicates directly and bilaterally with with citizens yes with the um, with the physical um, citizens so that already existed in the US in in Germany we did see that in 2021 but much much less than in the US but but maybe I don't know in India now but previously as we all know it was always the inspiration always came from the US but now maybe India will inspire us all with their electoral campaigns but yes that I mean, it's micro targeting is something um, something very dangerous, but with AI, it's even more dangerous. And what's impressive is that it's the image. I mean, Schulz is talking to you and he's telling you, yes, but you have to say Pedro Sánchez for people to understand. No, Marianne, no. Or, or he talks to me and he tells me Pedro Sánchez has talked to all Spaniards. That's old because because he's old, he uses X, he uses Twitter. But what's coming can be even more dangerous than that. It will not be plebiscitary. It cannot be talk, uh, talked about as plebiscitary. And the public where the public sphere, as Habermas recognizes, is that it's fragmented. We don't have a common world. So since we don't have a common world, that's why we have so many problems. Yes, but I think there are questions amongst the audience. Hello. I love the presentation. Thank you very much. And but I, I, I would have liked to hear some references, some references to the economic power and economic interests. During the seminary, we have been talking about all of these authoritarian uh, people that you have called illiberal, and I, I like the term illiberal. That have something in common. These are eccentric. Uh, people who are authoritarian, who do not respect the rules, but what's behind them? Because I do not believe that there is a phenomenon the world over where these people who are so similar appear, Meloni, Trump, Bolsonaro, all of these people, we talked about Olsen as well. So what are they defending? What's behind them? Who finances those campaigns? Who finances those, uh, those uh, thinking institutes that apply these new technologies? Because it's not just a problem that has to do with a political infrastructure. I'm guessing that there is something else. There is some sort of economic um, root to it. Yes. Well, in two in two sense, um, economic economic power in two in two ways. I mean, I was talking about the public sphere and um, the media, social media. Well, social media in in and of themselves are an economic power, a very important economic power. Elon Musk, for instance, uh, Zuckerberg, um, with Meta, Facebook, and so on. All of these, their their companies, Meta, I believe, is that belongs. I mean, Facebook belongs to Meta. WhatsApp belongs to Meta. Is the most valuable um, company in the history of the world. There has never been a more uh, valuable company than this one. So it's a huge economic power. So I also wanted to, to show these platforms, these actors, these, these companies do not have any interest in, in uh, reducing the propaganda, incivility, disinformation. They have no interest whatsoever because it's the economic power that pushes them forward. Now, the actors themselves, I mean, here we see different scenarios, of course. 
there are actors such as Viktor Orban who has reached the power and and then by being in the power he has started to build how do you say that um a an interest network an oligarchy and an, an oligarchy network because he has co-opted for instance people from the world of the economy to his um to his ideals and his program his vision and he has uh, attracted those people and then he is, I do, you do. I give you, you give me. So those people give him the money so that then they can feed all of his, his programs that are quite corrupt. We all know that because the EU is, I mean, the, the anti-fraud agency is trying to, to, to surveil him. So, so those people are taking hold of the economy and he gives them some political power as well so how do you say that it's a gegenseitige hilfe it's a correlative help it's a reciprocus um reciprocus help between those economic forces and those illiberal actors in the case of orban for instance in the case of trump well he already had the money so he used it to to enlarge his 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 domain, his influence, and his power. So uh, there are different scenarios. So that's what I meant. Yes, I think the gentleman wanted to ask a question as well. Good afternoon, and thank you so much for this conference. I don't know if I will know how to phrase a question I want to ask. I'm going to try. So in the end, liberal democracy. Uh, has worked in a very rational way, always being, always having its own arguments and reasoning. Um, and now we have a system where communication is very direct and and it is quite emotional as well. Probably not very rational. So how do you think our democracy, our liberal democracy could evolve so that it becomes more complete and can compete against the social media that are so ready to to react emotionally. So the, the danger of emotions, really. Yes, the danger of emotionality or emotions. Well, um, you first of all, you are right. What we see in the studies, in the studies of um, communication in social media, is that we see that emotions have gone have been rising quite a bit there is not so much argument there isn't there isn't so much reasoning there isn't much deliberation in the strict sense of the word and there is much emotion lots of emotions and that that is correct and and we can change this somehow well maybe maybe we can with what I said previously, those educational programs that I mentioned previously that should work uh, from, from the schools with kids because they are the ones who will be using social networks, I mean, social media. So we need an education that is that targets digitization as well and the use of digital tools. I don't know how it works in Spain, uh, but um, in Germany, currently, the digitization it does not exist in schools. It doesn't exist. So maybe there are, there are, there are computers, yes. We do have the hardware, but, but in the CVs and in the educational content, there is no word about digitization. So, to me, that is a great uh, failure. I mean, it is an important deficit. It's a dysfunction, really. And I think that we need to prepare our teachers and um, 
to include a digital education in schools. Because I think that we are not going to eliminate emotions completely, but we have to try to go back to, to teaching kids, to teaching children what information really means. What is information? What is the correct information? How do I communicate? What is communication? So something quite basic, really. And... And that is not happening in my country. No, that doesn't happen here. Yes, I'm afraid that it's something that isn't happening in other countries either. Yes, I'm sure. Yes, please. Over there. Hello, thank you very much. I know I was a bit late, but it was very interesting. I do not agree with the fact that politicians have now entered... Uh, the, the fact that the politicians have entered the media is causing what is happening. I think it's a consequence. I, they had to take the shortest route because I think that the problem is not a problem of speed. I think uh, linking to what I um, heard was said here with the Italian speaker that we're going so quickly that there is a lack of reflection everywhere. And I think that education... Oh, as soon as we have a leader, they want to control the education. So we are in a vicious circle here. And I think that speed, the speed at which we're going, has a lot to do with this. I mean, communication is is overlapping. I mean, media are always overlapping. There's always noise. And it's impossible to reflect when there is so much noise. And I think that the speed that the new media is giving is is ruining the depth of things and reflection stopping and thinking about things and, and talking about things with someone who thinks differently to you. I'm very pessimistic, I have to say. Thank you. Well, that wasn't a question, was it? It was just, yes, I, I mean, yes, the speed. Yes, it's true. I, I, we know that the speed is, is a problem but also it's a problem for politicians. We have to say that as well. Because if we talk to politicians, if we talk to MPs, they all tell you that they are under an amazing pressure as well. Because they know, because they also, I mean, it's the logic of communication as well. Uh, the logic of communication says that politicians have to react. They have to react um, as soon as possible. And if you do not react as a politician, then uh, your your opponent will, and and then you have lost that battle, right? You have lost a communication battle. So, in that sense, I also think that it creates a certain pressure, pressure that is very difficult for politicians. And politicians will always be the first ones to say, "Well, please uh, get rid of that speed. I would love to get rid of that speed." Yes, but the new media, the new uh, social media are even faster because the traditional media were, I mean, we had to wait till the next day to be informed and that was right. It was not a problem. Now we ne immediately need to know everything. We need to have the news immediately, 24 hours a day. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much for your conference, Professor. I... I think that Habermas is one of the last uh, voices of modernity. I'm sorry, if you could put it closer to your mouth. Thank you so much for your conference. I, I do think that Habermas is one of the last voices of modernity, and I think that uh, his biography is, is always present in his reflection of the, third, of the first, third shape of the public sphere. But I think that precisely because he's one of the last voices of modernity, we can um, oppose some things to that analysis framework that you have uh, presented us uh, with, because when we think about the different possibilities of a uh, public sphere, liberal public sphere, or illiberal public sphere, I think that part of, of the ideal, of the light that Habermas still projects with his work, have to do with two very different spaces. In one space, we work the autonomy and the bond, uh, political bonding. And on the other hand, we work in the space of domination and enlarging or extending or exponentially growing 
all the structural biases and justice and equality that come from the 20th century, but now they have they have multiplied by 100 with extraordinary speed. So if we think about the uh, about opposing two ideas framed in a specific conception of history, I think that that has led us to think about the blind spots of this whole world. I think that the past right now has an utopian potential in that sense. I think that going back to thinking about the past will allow us to detect blind spots in our present. And in that sense, I wanted to to just um, start a dialogue with you with regards to a um, reference that never prescribes, which is that of Aristotle, because there is a um, um, fundamental argument in the second book of rhetoric where Aristotle talks about deliberation as a mechanism that will lower the uh, lower f uh, fear from being scared because because with with when you're scared you can be hopeful and i think that one of the ways to to go back to to creating public spheres other public spheres that do not obey uh, the patterns of classic liberalism would be that idea of the fact that deliberation public conversation could help us reduce terror because with constant news with constant news in our cell phone with um, nuclear threats, third world wars, uh, post climate crisis, that is currently in our cell phones. So we can also understand that the modern project had other intermediaries and now we have other intermediaries because I don't think that uh, the avatar is still, um, is still an intermediary that supposedly is dialoguing, although it's not dialoguing, it's just talking to its to its targets, to its potential voters. So I think that opposing uh, this modern project to this project that is currently being built and that forces us to rethink all the concepts and that's forcing us to do something much more difficult, which is to give a name to something that has no precedent, and that is a great challenge. Hannah Arendt or Sugov talk about this difficulty. I think it would be a a way of also thinking about the problem of the legitimacy of institutions, because it's not just an ideal, it's not just in the lyrical uh, sense. This philosophical reflection could, um, could also improve the, the relationship and the, and the trust in democratic institutions. Thank you very much. Yes, I, I really like the idea that That negativity, which is also a characteristic of, of communication, does have an influence in in trust potentially or legitimacy of the institutions. It does have a very important um, aspect to the. To, I mean, that point. I do believe it's a very important one, um, but also it's very similar to. To, the, to what was said previously about speed and acceleration. We can say that we have seen an intensification in negativity in the communication of feelings as well, and messages in, in, social, in social media, in conventional media as well. A few weeks ago, I... I also had a conversation in a round table with on on trust in democratic institutions and there was a journalist round uh, round that table and interestingly enough she she always wanted to explain that it's really very important to inform uh, citizens uh, in a correct way and and give them as much information as possible, and it was very important, and so on. But at the same time, a minute later, she would say, but the thing is, people are so negative, but we have to, we have to, to give them what they expect. So that what they want is negativity. So the information in the media is usually negative because we give them what they want. So positive information is something that people don't listen to. So, so we see there that 
that's it's a self a self it's a self reference isn't it because the media do what they think the citizens want and the citizens want something from the media that and 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 they're frustrated because because they're different so so there's a dilemma there i think that there is a dilemma there a real dilemma between the expectations of citizens and the logic of the media and how they interact yes but that i'm sorry if if you not if you don't mind i i would like to briefly interfere Yes, but that's the problem of the economy of attention in which we are. Um, in which we are, it's what you were saying previously. The attention is concentrated on extremist positionings, but being extremist is something that catches everyone's attention, just like emotions, right? So, so this theatralization of a, an emotional positioning is something that attracts more than than just a rational argument. Uh, being sensible, because human beings are like that, aren't they? So, so the algorithm, the algorithm. What you were saying, we have to change the algorithm. Yes, because the algorithm is designed to to incentivize that which generates attention and sends a conflict, and that myth of collapse. Collapsology is called by the French collapsology. So we are facing the end of the world. That catches everyone's attention. So there is a very important component there that incorporates in this this circle. And just like those um, analysts, tremendous analysis that are being done by different political standpoints, they are hyper dramatizing things. So we have to sometimes channel what politicians say, analyze it seriously, and then realize that that nothing there is nothing dramatic about it, and nothing scandalous about it, nothing scandalous behind their their statements. It's just the way in which the media informs about this or that is they, they make it seem scandalous when it's not and I think that that's where I believe is very difficult to, to have political control not even through education because because it's it's technologically biased really there is an influence but the new uh, technological tools it's the algorithm and others such as the the media that Macron, uh, the the measures that Macron had thought of to avoid fake news was actually to be able to touch the algorithms and tweak them. But obviously, big platforms would close um, ranks against that. But it's a fascinating thing. You've already anticipated it in your presentation. We are uh, we're in the midst of a change of paradigm. Um, what we used to call the public sphere has called, and and that is no longer useful. So we need to define it some some other way. And what's difficult is is to know what elements, as you very well said, come from from the past, and how can we redefine or how can we start defining phenomenons that up till now did not take place and that could could be left in the shadows. And I think that's a challenge for. A, for us theorists, but for everyone as a society. And I also wanted to ask you a question, if I may. Are there more questions in the room? No? It's, it's about the topic that you just touched upon, which I thought was fascinating, um, observing what happened in the pandemic. Because in the pandemic, we, we became members of community, right? We stopped being selfish, we stopped being individualistic, and we wanted to applaud those who sacrifice themselves for the community. What's good is to be a nurse, to be a doctor, to be a food delivery person. And as soon as the pandemic ended, immediately we went back to and, and with much more strength to the previous situation, individualistic, consumerism, why i don't i don't really understand why because we haven't learned anything and i'm saying this um individually i mean at the individual level but also that can be very well observed if now once again as a scientist i can see that socially and at the political level as well and i would even talk about the digitization level we can also talk about that for instance in i think that germany is is 
um, is in a worse situation than Spain. Germany is a country of development. Um, we are a developed country in digitization, but what happened in Germany during the pandemic was that it was a disaster, a complete disaster, because a whole education was in the ground. I mean, we couldn't, we couldn't teach online, we didn't have the infrastructure, we didn't have the capacity, we didn't have the, the, the tools, we didn't have the computers, we were far worse than Spain, I can say that. So what happened? Well, scientists, just like me, who work on digitization, I was saying in the media and so on, well, we have to learn from this experience, we have to we have to make progress, we have to advance in this digitization journey. And also with regards to health administration processes, for instance, uh, for instance, communication between the agencies and um, public health agencies, it was a disaster in Germany. Well, what we were saying, what we were saying during those two years is we need to make progress, we need to change things, we have to introduce new new um, digitization approaches and so on and the politics were the, the the politics were sensitive at a certain point but as soon as the pandemic stopped well everything was stopped i mean digitization was no longer a topic and we currently are in the same spot we were after the pandemic so nothing has changed we haven't learned a thing the politicians haven't learned anything but society, as you just said, um, that is my experience, hasn't learned anything either. We haven't learned anything from that experience. And I think that it is dysfunctional. We, we can say it that way. If a crisis, such as the crisis that we had, if oh, oh. Uh, during such a crisis, something good uh, should come about, uh, should come from it, and it should be the lessons learned. We should have learned lessons, and we haven't learned those lessons. And I don't see, I mean, at least in my country, and I don't see that other countries have actually learned them, their lessons. I don't think that they're better. No, actually, here in Spain, during the pandemic, we... We saw that some politicians started talking about freedom as the self-gratification. I have rights. I have the right to this or that. I have the right to get out to the street, to drink beers and so on. It was a very individualistic positioning and, and, and it's that clash really because initially it seemed that uh, there would be social cohesion, that there would be that cohesion in a... In a in a, in a society that, was, that did not look at others, started merging. But as soon as it came, it disappeared. One last question. Javi, I'm sure you have one last question. Yes, I do. Well, there are a couple of questions from the audience that have to do with, with Habermas theory and with Habermas theory. And... And it's about whether the uh, deliberative ideal at some point it did take place or it could, could be felt, could be seen. The question is if we could see any moment in the history of liberal democracies where that uh, deliberative ideal has taken place beyond political institutions. So in the day-to-day -day of, of citizens, because if not, what we would be trying to do, and I think that's the question, is go back to an ideal that maybe never, never even existed. So I think it's a classical question in, in conversations about Habermas. Not even in university seminars uh, do we know an answer to that. No, but we will finish with this question, Marianne, uh, because we're a bit late. Well, in that sense, I'm really sorry but my um, answer will be very critical because I do think that that ideal, and that's what Habermas says, only existed in the 18th century, in the, uh, in this, in the century of enlightenment, an illustration, and that is what Habermas describes himself. 
He says that those the conversations, that culture of cafes and conversations where there were deliberations uh, in a reasoned way. Well, we all know that that that's not true. I mean, I'm not being, um, I'm not wearing my scientist cap, but those conversations, those cafes, those uh, where Habermas says there were deliberations, where inclusive deliberations, inclusive deliberations, reasoned uh, conversations were not really inclusive because there were no women, for instance, and, and there were only intellectuals, so that's not very inclusive. What Habermas describes is a world that that is ideal for some of them because it was just a little bubble, wasn't it? It's, we could say that it was a little bubble, yes, it was just a little bubble of, with some, some, uh, some intellectuals, members of the academia, all of them men, who were sitting around in their cafes having deliberations. So, I mean, so as you can see, my answer is quite critical of that, of, of that ideal, because I think that ideal, I mean, no, I don't think it ever existed. Despite, despite that, I do think that, as a politologist, I do think that there is a right to have normative models. I mean, we do have a right for normativity. I am not criticizing that a model can be normative, but then we also have to translate that into something that does have meaning, empirical meaning. And if it doesn't, then I'm really sorry, but we have to review it. In any, in any case, I think this seminary has been a good um, um, example of, of being that ideal, that Habermas ideal, trying to find understanding and communication between ones and others, because that is actually what we need to say from Habermas that there is a sort of action that that is not strategic, that does not look for some specific benefit or advantage, but that is just being consumed by the participation, that this joint participation to reach uh, mutual understanding. And the meaning of these seminars that are organized by the Institución Libre de Enseñanza is that it's just trying to get close to that. Um, as we all know, it cannot not be full because we know that even amongst intellectuals, it's more difficult to reach a conclusion, I think. But um, we can't, I think we're programmed to have conversations, discussions, and we can't, expect, we can't um, help but to try and meet again in activities such as this one. So once again, Marianne, thank you so much, and thank you all for being here. Thank you very much.